Hello and welcome. Uh, this is video number seven in an eight part series about World War I. And in this video, uh, the focus is going to be on the peace process after the fighting in World War I was completed. Uh, so hopefully you'll find this uh, helpful and an informative video. Let's get started. So we've gotten to the point where uh, an armistice was signed uh, November 11th, 1918. Uh, the fighting in World War I was over. Uh, so in many ways, now is time for the really hard part because as, as devastating as the, the four years or so of fighting had been, uh, it was going to be very important to be able to move forward in a positive way. And so the steps towards that, or at least the hopeful steps towards that, uh, began with the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, basically what the Paris Peace Conference was, uh, was a, a, a series of meetings uh, that took place throughout much of, of that next year uh, that involved uh, countries that had been involved in some way or another with the war. Uh, altogether, there were 32 countries represented at the Paris Peace Conference. Um, and it was all designed to try to figure out what happened and then make plans for the future uh, so that the future could be better and, and without war and just, just a, a positive move forward. Uh, but there were some important things to note about who was at this conference that I think from the beginning you can see uh, the potential for some, some problems and actually achieving a, a positive future. Uh, for starters, uh, even though there were many countries at the conference, there were basically four uh, that ran the show. Uh, they were collectively called the Big Four, and those countries were the United States, France, Great Britain, and Italy. In addition to having just a few countries basically running everything, uh, no one from the losing side was present. And where that can potentially be a big deal is, is from perspective, uh, that everybody that was at the conference all was from one side. And so the ability to maybe have some empathy or understanding of the perspective of the other side just, just wasn't there. And it's always hard to, to, to make agreements that are going to affect a whole group of people when you intentionally leave out certain, certain people. Uh, so this is going to be a challenging process uh, from the beginning. And in many ways, it was set up to not really succeed very well. All right, so the next thing, I wanna to talk just a little bit about the US perspective at the Paris Peace Conference. Um, our president at the time, President Wilson, uh, though the United States had stayed out of the war for a long time, um, had been very interested in, in the outcome of World War I and had a vision, I guess you could say, for what the future could look like. Now his vision, uh, was all put together in what he called his 14 points. And basically this would be uh, how he would set things up for the world moving forward if he had his way. Now I don't wanna go into a ton of detail uh, with his points, but you can see a few uh, listed on the screen there uh, that overall his 14 points were his plan for, for a just and lasting peace. Um, and just some of the things he talked about were countries not having secret treaties, that that only led to tension. Uh, that he felt like the, the seas should be free for anyone to sail in. He felt that trade should be free between countries, that that would be a positive for everybody. He wanted to see a reduction in the uh, fighting capacity of countries. And when it says colonial issues and new nations and borders, um, he, he felt it was important moving forward um, how it was determined, you know, what borders would exist for countries, what countries would exist if there were going to be new ones created, and that uh, people directly involved with those changes should be a part of the process of deciding what those changes look like rather than having just a couple of countries some other place make those decisions and so those were some of his big ideas now unfortunately for wilson uh, in this process at the peace conference it was about compromise and a lot of the ideas he had ended up needing to be cast away uh, for other ideas he had that he thought were more important and when it was all said and done he had to cast away uh, the vast majority of, of the ideas he had because there was one that he was hanging on to uh, that he wanted to make sure uh, would become a reality. And, and that was his last point um, where he talked about uh, something called, or it was described as a general association of nations uh, that would be able to, uh, to be this kind of global body uh, to oversee what was going on around the world, to be able to provide protection to, to everybody basically, and, and be the kind of thing that could uh, hopefully prevent uh, conflicts that came up from turning into something big and nasty uh, like World War I had been. 
And so when it was all said and done, that was one of the main things that he was able to get out of all of his ideas. Now, with the conclusion of the war, uh, there were treaties made uh, with each of the countries that had been on the side of the Central Powers. Um, the treaty that most commonly is talked about is the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which was a treaty uh, that was specific to Germany. And even though Germany was one of a number of countries that were on the Central Powers side, uh, they were the country during the war that was uh, probably the biggest aggressor, uh, played the biggest role in what happened. Um, and, and so it, it does make sense to give a lot of attention to the specific treaty to Germany. And it's also out of this treaty that we can see a lot of the, the, the problems uh, arise um, that would be in play moving forward. Because when you look at the treaty, you can see that it uh, didn't have a lot of a chance, uh, much chance to, to be very effective. So it says on the screen that it was a harsh settlement. Uh, that's really an understatement to say that it was a harsh settlement. Um, the perspective uh, behind making it was all about getting Germany to be punished. And definitely when you're talking about being able to move something forward in a positive way, if, if the perspective is all about hurting and punishing, um, it's unlikely that things are going to move forward very well. Uh, Great Britain and France in particular uh, wanted Germany to pay for what had happened. Uh, they were the two countries on the Allied side that most specifically and most directly and most significantly were hurt by what happened with the war. And, and so that was their perspective. Now, the treaty itself was signed on June 28, 1919, so five years to the day after Franz Ferdinand had been assassinated. Uh, we see the Treaty of Versailles signed. And even though German officials signed it, uh, that didn't necessarily mean that they agreed with it or liked it very much. Uh, one of the things that uh, led to them signing it and not you know, protesting or, or trying to work to get other things changed is, is food aid uh, for Germany uh, was tied to signing and, and getting on board with this treaty. Uh, so to a certain degree, they almost felt like they were in a position where they, they couldn't refuse to do that. Now, one of the things that came from the signing and development of the Treaty of Versailles was what was then called the League of Nations. And this was that, that, uh, that idea that Wilson had had for this, this global governing body. And the idea was that some of the early countries that were gonna be in it were the United States, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, all countries from the winning side. Um, initially, uh, countries like Germany and, and the other central powers were excluded. Uh, Russia was also excluded. Uh, so when you look just at the initial putting together of the League of Nations, you can see uh, that you had some problems there. Uh, if you're actively excluding countries, uh, that's not a very friendly approach uh, to, to, to global relations. At any rate, that's where things got started. Now, countries uh, that were initially excluded would, in most cases, eventually become a part of the League of Nations, at least for a while. Uh, but right out of the gate, uh, it was more of an exclusive group. Now, if you looked at some things uh, very specific to Germany in this treaty, uh, just to point out a few examples of things that, that they didn't like that weren't well received, um, that were kind of punishment oriented. Uh, one thing was Germany lost territory, uh, not terribly um, out of the ordinary in a, in a circumstance like this. Uh, and, and they were basically put back to the size where they were maybe a little bit smaller uh, prior to the war. Uh, their military was heavily restricted. Uh, they weren't uh, allowed to have uh, any kind of, a, of an air force. Um, a lot of what their military capacity was had to be destroyed. Um, very small army uh, was all they were really allowed to maintain, almost like a glorified police force. And so if nothing else, it left Germany feeling a little insecure. Um, probably some of the, the biggest things, uh, one was reparation payments. Uh, this would play out in a bad way for Germany moving forward. This was basically meant they had to, to pay for the damages uh, caused by the war, specifically to France and Great Britain. And what was really bad is they were gonna be asked to pay a lot of money that they just simply didn't have. And they would end up taking some pretty extreme steps that we'll talk about at a later point to try to make those payments. But pr probably from an emotional standpoint, one of the most upsetting things for Germany with this treaty was, was uh, something that was called the War Guilt Clause, where Germany had to acknowledge World War I was their fault. And I think if you think back to the beginning, uh, you realize that this was something that actually involved Serbian terrorists in Austria-Hungary, uh, that Germany certainly showed support for Austria-Hungary in the beginning, and they were a big part of the war. Uh, but I think you can see it's it's just plainly inaccurate to say World War One was Germany's fault. At any rate, that was a part of the deal.
Well, thank you for joining me for this video. Hopefully you found it helpful and informative. In the final video in the series, we'll talk about the legacy of World War I and the overall impact uh, that it had on the world, including taking a look at some of the problems uh, that came almost immediately uh, with the Treaty of Versailles. I hope, hopefully you'll join me for that. Thanks for watching.